I'm going to continue on St. Basil and fasting from this beautiful book. This is the second part of his homily one. It's not a second part, it's just the second part of this video. It's a very dense, beautiful homily that takes us on a biblical sweep of the importance of fasting in the Bible, starting at the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, going all the way through the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, going all the way through to, you know, through the through the Old Testament, looking at the patriarchs and fasting, and, you know, taking us into the New Testament. And that's where I hope to go with this now. Daniel fasted. He fasted for three weeks in the book of Daniel. And he, Basil says he even taught the lions to fast because they, would, they couldn't eat his flesh. That was, as it were, you know, made solid, made like cement, made like rock by fasting. Fasting, he says, quenched the power of fire and kept away the mouths of the lions. That's the book of Daniel. Fasting sends prayer up to heaven as if it were wings for the upward journey. Fasting is the expansion of households, the mother of health, the pedagogue of youth, an adornment for seniors, a good, a good companion on journeys, and a safe housemate for married couples. He's going to basically say, look, where you've got a married couple that practices regular fasting, you don't have to worry about adultery taking place. The wife doesn't have to worry about the husband and, and vice versa. Beautiful that, that it's the mother of health, the mother of health. I have a book on the history of fasting that I'm working through at the moment, and it shows how it was in the early 1900s that doctors were banned in America from prescribing fasting uh, as part of their therapy. But even today, you know, sometimes doctors will say, you know, don't eat for a certain period, maybe before a colonoscopy or something like that. But fasting as a therapeutic um, tool is really making a comeback, including in the medical profession. He goes on to say, no animal bemoans death. An implacable stomach neither sheds the blood of animals nor issues an order for their slaughter. The butcher puts down his knife and the table is content with plants. What a turn of phrase. So the vegetarians are happy, the animals get a rest. Fasting leads to true and enjoyable feasting, Basil notes. Don't you realize that the sun is more enjoyable after the night, that walking is more pleasure what waking is more pleasurable after sleep, that health is more appreciated after the experience of the of the contrary? So too is the table more charming after fasting, even if you are a pauper, with whatever is near at hand to you to eat, it will be sweet sauce. Hunger is sweet sauce, as the saying goes. El hambre, I used to say in our Spanish monastery. The example of the rich man should make you afraid. His lifelong indult, so now we're entering into the New Testament commentaries by St. Basil. The example of the rich man, he's referring to rich man in Lazarus. His lifelong indulgence brought him to the fire, for he was broiled in the flames of the furnace, not on the charge of wickedness, but of living sumptuously. We need water, he says beautifully, to extinguish that fire. And fasting is that water extinguishing the, fi the flames of sumptuous living. Digestive problems which are the necessary consequence of self-indulgence produce terrible maladies in the body. He's writing in the 300s. So this is the New Testament again proper. The life of what gave Lazarus rest in the bosom of Abraham? Wasn't it fasting? The life of John was a single, continuous fast. John the Baptist, the great ascetic. I love the way the Orthodox really 
uh, look to Saint John the Baptist as a, a great, the great saint after Jesus and Mary, the Mother of God. The fasting that Paul names when boasting over his afflictions brought him up to the third heaven. And that's a reference that can be checked out if you like. Where are we? 62. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty-seven and 22. Oh, sorry, and 12, verse 2. And now he's going to cite the example of Jesus himself, the principal example, he says, who fasted to fortify the flesh, and only after that he assumed for our sake did he receive in it the devil's assaults. In this he not only instructed us to fast in order to prepare and train ourselves for struggles with temptation, but also gave his adversary a kind of foothold he, what he's going to say is the devil could never have come near him but he fasted weakening his flesh to give a foothold so that he could be this example of how to overcome the devil through spiritual warfare including fasting and adherence to the will of god manifested through the scriptures But what about you? Aren't you letting yourself grow fat and obese? Are you placing no value on the salvific and life-giving doctrines when you cause your mind to waste away from want of such nourishment? Just to give you a flavor of, it's a challenging read at times. Hence, if you wish to make your mind strong, he's going to talk about how the flesh and the spirit do oppose one another. This is not just platonic dualism, it's biblical. And if you wish to make your mind strong, subdue your flesh through fasting. Indeed, this is what the apostle says. The more the outer man wastes away, the more the inner man is renewed. When I am weak, then I am strong. Obviously, that requires discernment, but uh, many of us could benefit from a certain... Um, a certain subduing of the flesh, shall we say, to grow stronger in the soul and in the with the Holy Spirit. One often finds juxtaposed in this homily the difference between luxurious living, sumptuous living, and asceticism with examples from the Bible. So we, we turn again to the, 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 the people of God in the Exodus and while they were content with manna and water, they conquered the Egyptian foes. They w w traveled through the sea, and God was with them. But when they remembered the flesh pots and returned to Egypt in their hearts, they did not see the promised land. Doesn't this example make you afraid? Doesn't gluttony make you shudder? Furthermore, if the angels have any food, he's going to say it is bread. As the prophet says, man ate the bread of angels in the Psalms. The vapors, I love this. He's going to return to Daniel here. and He's going to say, the wise Daniel would not have seen visions if he had not made his soul loosened through fasting. Loosened. For the vapors emitted by coarse food being, as it were, sooty and black, disrupt the illumination of the mind produced by the Holy Spirit like a dense cloud. St. Basil goes on to talk about, well, the, obviously these vapours, and, and I think we can all recognise that, that um, produces a kind of, you know, excess produces a kind of intoxication, a clouding of the mind. But he also goes on to say that anger must all, we must fast from the passions, the senses. Anger is a drunken state, he says, robbing like wine the soul of sense. Sadness, this is one, fast from sadness. Sadness too is a drunken state, he says, because it drowns the mind. Fear is another one. Drowning the mind 
with vapors. The scripture says, deliver my soul from fear of the enemy. And generally speaking, since each of the passions disturbs the mind, each can rightly be called a drunken state of the mind. Well, fasting is, a to is tough and it's an effort, but St. Basil reminds us the athlete prepares by training and the one who fasts by practicing self-control first. He concludes as the opening paragraph did, exhorting us that fasting is not in vain, it prepares a crown. So let us be cheerful in this battle, in this competition. Let us, like competitors, he says, set out for the race, persevering in these preliminary contests, and so arrive at the appointed day of coronation. Now we recall the saving passion, but in the age to come, may we be rewarded for our actions throughout life by the righteous judgment of Christ himself, to whom be glory forever. Amen. That's homily one. There's another homily in this book, um, lengthy homily on fasting, and there's others on thanksgiving and on martyrs, local martyrs who died in the time of St. Basil. There's also a homily on the birth of Christ, the nativity, and baptism. In the lovely Protestant church today on my travels, in mercy, and may the Lord be merciful to us. Amen.